want to know more? I'd love to know. You know. How should I know? Know what I mean? You don't know the half of it. In today's world of a billion voices, it is harder than ever to identify which information is worth paying attention to. Parents need to know what to trust and how to get to the truth of the matter. This is Parents in the Know. Emily M. Morgan here on Parents in the Know. Today's episode looks at the potential dangers and proven benefits of family pets. If you are unsure whether a pet is a good idea for your family and what the pros, cons and essential considerations might be, keep listening for some useful facts to help you with your decision. Pets and Kids, today on Parents in the Know. Is there any child in the world who doesn't want a pet at some point in their lives? Small children tend to have a fascination with the animal world, and this interest can span the entire animal kingdom. I love seeing babies shrieking with laughter when they catch a glimpse of a dog, duck or other animal. My two children certainly always love to see different animals, and my three-year-old, though a bit jaded towards the more common kinds, still exhibits an unholy interest in spiders, mice, and all manner of small creatures. She also loves watching little baby fluffy animals on YouTube whenever I chance to let her. It's always interesting to take her to the zoo because she never goes for the animals I think she will. It's the crocodiles or the birds rather than the orangutans or tigers for her. When I was a child, my brothers and I were careless creatures and although we were all desperate for a pet, I think my parents were wise not to get us anything too high maintenance. Like millions of children before us, we longed for a dog, but instead we had to put up with goldfish and some little terrapins, which, while cute, really didn't have the same appeal. To be fair, my father had and still has some pretty strong fur allergies, so even though I suspect my mother would have liked a dog or two, there was never any chance of one at home, really. But ultimately, we had a little budgie who lived as one of us for eight glorious years and was as close to our hearts as any dog could have been. How we loved that little budgie. Beaky was his name. He only returned to his cage to eat and sleep, and spent the rest of his days flying about the house, sitting on our shoulders to lean over and take nibbles of our toast, and attempting with admirable determination to build nests on our clothes errors with playing cards from the decks we left lying around after marathon sibling games of hearts or spoons. He didn't live as long as some budgies, but we were assured by the vet through our tears that he had been a very healthy and much-loved little bird who had simply not been given as many years as some of his peers. I must say that when little Beaky passed into the great aviary in the sky, it was traumatic in the extreme and put me off wanting a pet for quite some time. I was not even that close to him compared to my younger siblings, having lived overseas for a large part of his life but it came down to me to take him to the vet that fateful morning when he wouldn't get off the floor of his cage. I drove as carefully as I could, reassuring him in the back through my tears that he'd be okay. I rushed into the vets, and the jovial conversations in the waiting room came to an abrupt halt when they saw my streaming eyes. A respectful silence fell, and I was ushered straight in. Sadly, our little friend had passed on by then, and there was nothing to do but take him home and bury him with due ceremony. Parents in the know. There's no question that the passing of a beloved pet is traumatic and families go through an intense grieving process. People who don't own pets or even like animals much tend to struggle with this concept, but it is quite understandable. After all, we humans tend to invest a great deal of love and energy into our pets. Pets are uncomplaining, at least in words, They are companions to the lonely, playfellows for the young, and loyal friends to all. They can be taught to fit in perfectly with your habits, and that can't be said for many fellow humans. All pets, to a greater or lesser extent, bring with them unavoidable expenses. Think insurance, food and accessories, and vet bills. Plenty of mess. Think chewed toys, scratched furniture, not to mention accidents during the pet version of toilet training and large time and energy requirements from their owners when training them. However, owning a pet also has many benefits. Among other positives, 
owning a pet has been proven to help lower a child's risk of developing animal-related allergies by up to a third. Perhaps my father should have had pets as a child himself, as my mother did, and then we might have scored a dog after all. If allergies are already developed, getting a pet as an adult does not help, but it is a good factor to consider if your children are very young or not yet here. Pets are also great for developing empathy and social skills in children and adults alike. Pets have been used in prisons, hospitals and long-term care facilities to help residents get in touch with their caring sides. Animals have also been used successfully in these places to combat loneliness and depression. Additionally, much like children, pets are a great way of meeting new people with something in common. Going to a dog beach or park with your beloved dog will not only get you out and about and get you some great exercise, but put you in the vicinity of other dog lovers. There are clubs and associations for many other types of pet as well. Believe it or not, pets have even been shown to have positive effects on your physical condition, with dog and cat owners demonstrating better recovery from heart attacks and lower rates of heart attack in the first place. It is thought that this effect is caused by pet owners' reduced or better controlled stress levels. To bring the focus back to parents and families, pets have many great benefits for children as well. Animals have been used in schools and institutions to help developmentally challenged children learn by encouraging these children to relax and feel comfortable. Animals are also great companions for lonely or shy children and help them to develop social confidence to improve their relationships with their peers. One study found that children are very likely to go to their pets for companionship if they feel sad, angry, afraid, or if they have a secret. Pets don't talk and don't judge. They just listen and accept you for who you are. A very wonderful thing for anyone, but especially a child navigating the tricky waters of school, friendships, and difficult situations. Pets also provide a great opportunity for children to practice caring, nurturing, and responsibility. Learning from a young age to care and be responsible for the well-being of another is a skill that is very infrequently taught in today's modern society, where children are expected to look out for themselves and no one else. Older siblings are far less likely to be expected to take responsibility for younger siblings. In fact, it is positively frowned upon in our culture. Let kids be kids, we say, with every good intention. Unfortunately, a side effect from this is that children grow into adults with little or no experience or understanding of what it takes to care for others, whether they're partners, family members, or ultimately their own children. While girls do tend to practice these skills a little bit more than boys through playing with dolls, boys very rarely get any chance at all to practice nurturing behaviour, unless they have a pet. Looking after a pet is not considered by boys to be a girly behaviour so it gives them the perfect vehicle for learning to care. Finally, owning a pet provides a great opportunity for family bonding and group activities. Family walks and games of frisbee or ball throwing often centre around the pet. Of course, if your pet should become sick or inevitably pass away, you share the process of caring and eventually grieving as a family as well. Teaching a child about death, while not pleasant to think about, is something that will have to happen at some stage. With pets' shorter lifespans, it is likely that your children will experience the death of a beloved pet quite probably sooner than the death of a close family member, which may help to ease the sense of bewilderment that often accompanies grief at such a time. Parents in the know. Now we've examined the benefits to children and families of owning a pet, let's look at the dark side. What are the negatives of having an animal family member? Before we even launch into the health and safety, let's address the number one concern of whoever is in charge of the household, mess and responsibility. Who exactly will be taking care of the new addition and what will this entail? Day after day, year after year, who will walk the pet, feed the pet, teach the pet manners or required behaviour such as toilet training, and not scratching or destroying furniture and possessions. Who will clean up the messes, clean out the cage, remember to buy food and medicine and other supplies? Who will take it to the vet for its regular and one-off requirements? Who will take it to the grooming parlour? Who will organise a kennel or babysitter when you go away? 
Who will keep the pet if the family breaks up? And I'm not just talking about the separation of parents. What about when a child leaves home for study or work? There's more to consider. Who will remember to renew the pet insurance? Who will pay for it all? Pets are costly creatures. If you can't get agreement and confidence in the follow-through on these questions, then you are in for a rough ride. The number of abandoned pets has fallen in recent years, but still well over 50,000 cats and 50,000 dogs are handed into the RSPCA every year, not to mention other animals. Rather than add to the population of feral cats destroying native wildlife, or add to the burden of organisations like the RSPCA, it might be better to really think about the issue, work through the scenarios, and allocate responsibility in a way that everyone can live with before you start browsing for a critter. Once you've made the decision to get a pet, you need to decide what kind is best for you and your family. You first need to consider practical questions. Do you have a big enough space for a large animal to run about in? Are you home long enough to provide adequate companionship to a social animal? Do you have an enclosed outdoor area that your pet can't escape? Or are you prepared for your pet to be a full-time indoor pet, perhaps with a daily walk on a leash? And yes, I'm talking to cat and rabbit owners too, not just dog owners. Are you fit enough or do you have enough time to go on those really long walks twice a day that some animals need? Do you have young children who might treat a delicate pet roughly? Do you have allergy sufferers in the house who might react badly to a certain type of pet? Can you afford to heat or cool the house or pet enclosure adequately for a pet that needs extra warmth or cooling? Can you afford the food and medicine and possible future treatments for common health problems of that particular breed or specialised equipment which that pet needs? Now you've ticked all those boxes, it's time to consider the final piece of the puzzle, your family's health and safety. There are a few simple rules to remember. The first is that animals are animals, not humans, no matter how human-like their behaviour can be. Their reactions can be surprising because we can come to expect them to behave as a human would. Many pets, including cats and dogs, have sharp teeth and claws and they know how to use them. If threatened or startled, any animal can bite or scratch, and sometimes it can be difficult to predict what might set them off. Stories abound of family dogs who have lived closely and amicably with humans and other animals for years, suddenly attacking and seriously injuring or even killing another animal or tragically a human child. It is essential that educating your family about animals and their behaviour is a priority in your preparation for getting a pet. There are many great animal trainers and animal behaviour educators out there. Jump online and get learning. Some simple rules to follow with dogs. Never leave your under five alone with a dog, especially if it is a strange dog or if the dog is eating or sleeping. Always supervise your young child when they are playing with a dog as they have difficulty understanding restraint or when to back off. Signs to teach your child to watch for around their dog include if it lifts its lips, growls, backs away, raises the hair on its back, or stares at you. It is important also to teach your children from a very young age never to approach a strange dog unless the owner is there and gives permission. And if a strange dog approaches them, they should stand still, hands by their sides in fists, and should not run scream or stare into the dog's eyes. Parents in the know. Cats, on the other hand, have a bad rap regarding an illness called toxoplasmosis. This is an illness which can be dangerous for pregnant women and immunodeficient people, but for other people it presents only as a cold, if at all. If a pregnant woman catches the disease, about a third of the time their unborn child will also get it, and the effects can be devastating, even if not immediately obvious at birth. However, and this is the big thing to remember, cats are not the most common transmitters of this parasite. In fact, if you keep your cat indoors, don't let them hunt prey, and don't feed them raw meat, they will most likely never catch the disease 
and therefore never pass it on to you. Even if a cat does catch the disease, they will usually only shed the bacteria for a few days out of their whole lives, and not on their fur or claws. A human is more likely to catch it from eating raw meat or unwashed fruit and vegetables than from a cat. Some people also worry that cats might climb into a baby's cot and suffocate the baby. Some have even claimed that cats deliberately attempt to suck air out of babies' mouths. This is completely unproven and highly unlikely, according to Dr. Terry Schweiss, Vice President of Animal Welfare at the United States Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. The only reason to keep cats out of babies' cots is the same reason you should keep soft toys, cushions and loose blankets out of babies' sleeping spaces. The risk of accidental suffocation. So cat owners who become pregnant don't need to worry too much about having to choose between their beloved animal and their new child. Let's briefly examine one other popular pet choice. Birds. Birds can carry parrot fever, which is a nasty flu-like sickness that comes with a very high temperature. You should always wash your hands after touching birds. However, in many years of owning birds, and, I confess, not much hand washing after handling them, my family never had a serious issue, though that could simply have been luck. Additionally, curved beak birds can cause some damage with bites as well, so it's best to try for a more easy-going bird. We've had some pretty nasty-minded cockatiels in our time. If in doubt, pick a small, straight-beaked bird. Never put a curved-beak bird in an aviary with straight-beaked birds. The curvy beak will kill the straight beaks, as we discovered the hard way. Parents in the know? For more information and resources for parents, visit my website, www.emilymmorgan.com. Subscribe there to receive free additional resources of use to parents, schools and businesses on this topic and many others. You'll also receive the full transcript and additional resources if you sign up. Send your comments and queries to my Facebook page, Emily M. Morgan Me, or email me, write to emhere at gmail.com. You can leave a comment at the website as well. If you like this podcast, I would greatly appreciate you leaving a review with a comment so that others can discover it. Thank you so much in advance. In the next episode of Parents in the Know, we will have a look at dummies, also known as pacifiers, binkies, bobos, comforters and soothers. The pros, the cons, the haters and the rabid fans. Dummies, do they really suck? Next time on Parents in the Know. Thanks for listening.